Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, coming to this briefing to wrap up the uh, meetings over the last two days between President Obama and President Xi. Um, I'll turn it over here uh, to our National Security Advisor, Tom Donilon, to give a readout of those meetings. Um, afterwards, we'll take questions. Um, Tom, of course, has been very focused on uh, this uh, China uh, meeting as the lead person for the President on U.S.-China relations, uh, so he can speak to anything associated with that or um, other foreign policy questions. Uh, I'm happy to uh, also take questions on the uh, FISA-related stories that have been in the news recently. Uh, in that regard, I would draw your attention to a fact sheet that we sent to uh, our press uh, on the uh, collection of intelligence pursuant to Section 702 uh, of FISA, um, as it provides a very good baseline of details uh, on that program. Uh, but with that, I'll turn it over to Tom uh, to give you an opening presentation, then we'll take questions. Thank you, Ben. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry to be a little late. Uh, I wanted to talk today about the uh, quite unique uh, and important meetings that took place between President Obama and President uh, Xi Jinping of China over the last couple of days here in California. Uh, I'd, I'd say at the outset that the President had uh, very good discussions in, in an informal atmosphere, a uniquely informal atmosphere, uh, uh, with President Xi over the last two days. The discussions were positive and constructive, wide-ranging. Uh, and quite successful in achieving the goals that we set forth for this, uh, for this meeting. Uh, before I turn to the, uh, to the specifics uh, on, the, uh, on the meeting, I wanted to give, a, I wanted to give some context for this. Um, the meeting, of course, is an important part of the President's broad national security strategy that we've outlined since the beginning of this administration, underscoring the importance of the United States uh, having productive and constructive relationships with the important powers in the world. And our strategic observation that if those relationships are constructive and productive, that in fact the United States could more effectively pursue its national interests and that we could, with others, uh, solve uh, global problems more effectively. This meeting is also uh, uh, central to our re Asia Pacific rebalancing strategy. As I've said many times, uh, the President believes that uh, uh, the Asia's future and the future of the United States are deeply and increasingly linked. Uh, and we judged uh, early during our term in office actually during the transition, that we were underweighted in, uh, in Asia, and we have been overweighted in other parts of the world in the prior six or seven years, particularly with respect to our military operations in the Middle East and in, the, and in South Asia. So we took, uh, undertook a determined strategy aimed at sustaining a stable security environment in a regional order uh, rooted in economic openness and peaceful resolution of disputes and respect for universal rights and freedoms in Asia. Our rebalancing strategy, of course, has a number of elements, strengthening alliances, deepening partnerships with emerging powers, empowering regional institutions, helping to build regional economic architectures that can sustain shared prosperity. TPP, obviously, is at the, at the core of that. And, of course, it includes building a stable, productive, and constructive relationship with China that we've been about from the outset of the administration. Uh, with respect to, the, uh, uh, to this meeting, uh, as I said at the outset, in many ways, it is a unique meeting. And again, if you go back through studying each of the encounters between an American president and the leadership of China since President Nixon's historic meeting in February of 1972 in China, I think the uniqueness and the importance of a number of aspects of this encounter really come to the fore. Number one, the setting and the style. Uh, the setting here obviously was in a very informal setting, and the style was informal uh, between uh, the President of the United States and the President of China which is not the normal uh, setting for these meetings, if you've studied them over the, uh, over the years. I guess the closest meeting that, that came uh, with respect to kind of style would have been the Crawford meeting in 2002 between President Bush and uh, John Z. Men. But that meeting was at the end of his tenure, uh, John Z. Men's tenure, and it, the total meeting time was only, I think, I think an hour and a half or two hours. Uh, this meeting was entirely different, obviously. Secondly, uh, the length of the discussions, which uh, we calculated approaching eight hours, uh, and the breadth and depth of the discussions, which were uh, quite strategic uh, and, curried, and covered virtually every aspect of the United States-China uh, relationship. Third, the timing. And the timing was quite, quite important here. It is at the outset of President Obama's second term in office as President of the United States. It is at the outset of uh, President Xi's tenure as President of China uh, in an expected 10-year uh, uh, period. Uh, so. Uh, Point one. Uh, point two, it also comes at an important moment of transition for the United States. As, as I said, we're embarking on the President's second uh, term. But 
but also at a point where we really are um, looking at second term priorities and our economy is recovering, I think, and a lot of the restoration work that we've done in the first term is coming to uh, fruition. And third, we do face an intense range of bilateral, regional, and global challenges on which U.S.-China cooperation is, uh, is critical. So the setting, the style, the length uh, and of discussion, the breadth of the issues discussed, and the timing, I think, all underscore the point that this is an important uh, uh, and unique uh, meeting between the U.S. President and the leader of China. And again, I think if you go back through and do a careful study of the encounters between the leaders of the United States and China since 1972, I think that really does become, uh, become uh, uh, quite clear. How did this meeting come about? Uh, let me discuss that for just a couple of minutes. Uh, we had, from the outset of the second term, undertaken to, in a deliberate and purposeful way, engage with the leadership of the new leadership of China. Indeed, President Obama had a telephone conversation with President Xi congratulating him on his election as president on March 14th, the day he was elected. I think he had really literally just come from the meeting, and President Obama had talked to him that, uh, that afternoon. We then undertook a series of encounters with the Chinese. Uh, Secretary Liu went out almost immediately to discuss economic issues. General Dempsey, the head of our Joint Chiefs of Staff, went out to discuss uh, military and security issues. Secretary, Secretary Kerry went out to discuss uh, diplomatic issues and, public and uh, foreign policy issues. And I followed on uh, the three of those meetings with my own uh, travel to China just a couple of weeks ago to discuss the broad range of issues facing the United States and China and to lay the foundation for this meeting. So again, we've had a purposeful and deliberate effort to engage within the leadership of China and to work on this relationship as we go into, a, into our second term. Next, uh, we asked ourselves, uh, when should the President and uh, President Xi uh, meet each other? Uh, and on the current schedule, that wouldn't have been until the G20 meeting in St. Petersburg this September. And it struck us as being too long of a time. The vacuum would have been too great, and the President decided that he would uh, undertake uh, to try to schedule a meeting uh, 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 at an early date. And that, and that is, of course, is this, uh, is this meeting. We also uh, thought hard about the style of the meeting uh, and what the purpose would be. Uh, and we uh, uh, had as a goal, a specific goal, to build a, uh, a personal relationship between uh, the President and or President Xi and to have an opportunity, not under the pressure of being on the margins of another multilateral meeting, to really sit down and explore uh, the contours of the U.S.-China uh, US uh, uh, relationship. The structure of the meetings. Uh, the meetings began, as you know, yesterday afternoon. Uh, and the initial topics for discussion uh, uh, were uh, the priorities that each president has for his country today in order to set the strategic context for the discussion. So President Xi talked at some length about his plans uh, for his presidency and his uh, uh, government's uh, uh, plans across a range of issues, starting with the economic issues. President Obama talked about his plans for his second term uh, and how he saw uh, things unfolding. And then they had a broader conversation about how these, uh, 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 the strategic context affected U.S.-China uh, relations. So uh, that was, a, again, I think a unique conversation between a president of the United States and a president of China. Uh, to have, again, at the outset of President Obama's second term and at the beginning of President Xi's term, uh, a quite lengthy discussion about how they see where their countries uh, are uh, domestically and what their priorities are internationally. That was the first uh, set of sessions. Secondly, last night, uh, over dinner, uh, we discussed the full range of bilateral issues, uh, including security issues, and had a lengthy conversation last night about uh, North Korea, which I can talk about if you'd like to, if you'd like to do that. Uh, this morning, uh, uh, President Obama uh, and President Xi went for a, uh, a walk to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, a true one-on-one -on -one meeting with just interpreters present. Uh, went for a walk around the property here and then uh, found a place to sit down. That uh, meeting lasted for about 50 minutes, 5-0, about 50 minutes uh, the, uh, uh, this morning. And again, talking about a number, of, uh, a number of the key issues between the United States and China. They came back from that meeting uh, and we sat down again at the conference table uh, and uh, then undertook uh, a quite extensive discussion about economic issues, uh, including cyber issues, uh, which of course we believe needs to be at the center of the economic discussions that the United States uh, and, China, uh, and China are having. As I said, last night at dinner, uh, we had a lengthy discussion about North Korea. And let me talk about that just for, uh, just for a couple of minutes. Uh, as I said, it was, it was a significant discussion last night during the dinner. Uh, and as, as uh, you all know who cover this uh, issue, China has taken a number of steps in recent months to send a clear message to North Korea 
including through en en enhanced enforcement of sanctions and through public statements uh, by the senior leadership in China. The President's agreed last night uh, that this is a key area for U.S.-China enhanced uh, cooperation. They agreed that, the North, that North Korea has to denuclearize, that neither country will accept North Korea as a nuclear armed state, and that we would work together uh, to deepen U.S.-China uh, cooperation and dialogue to achieve denuclearization. The President also stressed to President Xi that the United States will take any steps that we need to take to defend ourselves and our allies from the threat that North Korea uh, presents. We st the two sides stressed the importance of continuing to apply pressure, both to halt North Korea's ability to proliferate and to make clear that its continued pursuit of nuclear weapons is incompatible with its economic development goals. The discussions on this issue, I believe, will allow us to continue to move ahead and work uh, in, a, in, a, in a careful way in terms of uh, our cooperation uh, to uh, work together to achieve our ends. Uh, I think the bottom line is I think we had quite a bit of alignment on, on the Korean issue, the North Korean issue, and uh, absolute agreement that we would continue to work together on concrete steps uh, in order to achieve uh, the joint goals that the United States and China have with respect to uh, the North Korea nuclear uh, program. Uh, as I said during the economic discussion uh, that we had uh, today, uh, cybersecurity uh, and cyber issues were uh, an important topic. Uh, and again, I think they took, uh, actually those issues took up most of the discussion uh, this morning uh, between uh, President Obama and President Xi. Obviously, given the importance of our economic ties, the President made clear the threat po uh, posed uh, 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 to our economic and national security by cyber-enabled economic espionage. And I want, to be, I want to be clear on exactly what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here are efforts uh, by uh, entities in China uh, to, uh, uh, through cyber attacks, uh, uh, engage in the theft of public and private, uh, public, public and private property, intellectual property and other property uh, in the United States. Um, and that is the focus here, and that's, which is why uh, it was in the economic discussion this morning. Um, and uh, again, we had a, de a detailed discussion on this. Uh, the President underscored uh, that resolving this issue is really key to the future of U.S.-China economic uh, relations. Uh, he asked President Xi uh, to continue to look uh, seriously uh, at the uh, uh, problem that we've raised here. And again, I gave a speech on this uh, in uh, March in New York. Um, uh, and went through exactly what the agenda would be for us with respect to, the, to China. And number one is to acknowledge this concern. And I think this concern is acknowledged at this point. Number two, to investigate specifically uh, the types of uh, um, activities that we uh, have, uh, have identified here. Uh, and the Chinese have agreed to look at this. And third, uh, to uh, engage in a, a dialogue with the United States on norms and rules. That is, what is, uh, what is, what is, uh, what is, uh, uh, acceptable and what's not acceptable in the realm of, uh, in the realm of cyber. Uh, the two presidents provided guidance to the new cyber working group, which you know has been set up under our strategic and economic dialogue, which will engage in a dialogue, as I said, on the rules and norms of behavior uh, in cyberspace over the longer term and explore confidence building measures. And, and we instructed the teams to report back on their discussions to the, uh, to the leaders. Um, other issues that were, uh, uh, that were discussed at some length, obviously, was, it was the economy, and we can go into some uh, some depth on that, if, you, if you'd like to, human rights. Uh, and importantly, uh, mil military to military relationships uh, between the United States and China. This has been an important aspect of our discussions with China uh, in the last year and a half or two years. And the fact is, of course, that there are military to military relationships that lag behind our political and our economic relationship. This is acknowledged on the Chinese side, and we actually have some momentum behind increasing and deepening these relationships as. Uh, as we go forward here, as we try to build a comprehensive and positive uh, relationship with, uh, uh, with China. Uh, I think, again, that the, that the President's meetings here at uh, Sunny Lands were, as I said, without a doubt, unique. Uh, and as President Obama said yesterday, the challenge that he and President Xi face uh, is to turn the aspiration of charting a new course here for a relationship into a reality. Uh, and to build out what President Xi and President Obama have called the new model of relations between great powers. So with that, uh, I'd be glad to take your questions. I could also go on for another hour or two about the uh, details of the meeting. Uh, Julie? Thank you. Okay. Uh, can you, oh, sorry. Thanks. Um, Tom, you said yes. that um, 
the concern about cyber yeah. is acknowledged at this point by the Chinese. Yeah. How specific are they in this acknowledgement in the mm -hmm. private meetings, given that in public they, they tend to avoid acknowledging this? And Xi also mentioned last night um, at the bilat that uh, China has been a victim of cyber hacking as well. Yeah. Are they targeting, are they saying that the U.S. is targeting China? Or are they leaving that sort of more broad in these discussions? Yeah, a couple of things on that. Thanks, Julie. Uh, number one, uh, as I said, it's important to understand exactly what we're talking about here. The discussion that we're having with China uh, with respect to this topic is, not, is, is really not focused on cyber hacking and cyber crime. These are problems that we face and we face jointly, and we need to work together uh, in a joint way to defend ourselves against these and to come up with norms and rules of the road with respect, uh, with respect to that, those, uh, those problems, again, that we face as two nations whose economy and whose uh, uh, full range of activities are increasingly online, uh, increasingly linked up to the internet, which makes them vulnerable. That's not the focus of the discussion, though, uh, that, we had, uh, that we had today. Uh, and it, ex except to the extent that we both acknowledge that this is a problem, and for two, uh, and for two of the, for the two largest economies in the world, addressing them is important. But the, the specific issue uh, that President Obama talked to President Xi about today uh, is the issue of cyber, uh, uh, enabled economic theft, theft of uh, uh, intellectual property uh, and other kinds of property uh, in the public and private realm uh, in the United States by entities uh, uh, based in China. Uh, and the President went through this in some detail today with some specifics today uh, and asked that the, uh, the Chinese um, government um, uh, engage on this issue uh, and understand that uh, it is, uh, if it's not addressed, uh, if there continues to be this direct theft um, of United States property, that this was going to be a very difficult problem in the economic relationship and was going to be an inhibitor, inhibitor to the relationship really reaching its full potential. Uh, we've undertaken, as you, know, as you know, a systematic effort with respect to this issue. Uh, we have had uh, conversations with the Chinese about it. Uh, over the course of the last uh, year or so. Uh, we've raised it publicly. I did so as the per first, uh, a person to do, a first administration official to do it. And we have had increasingly uh, direct conversations with the Chinese through the various dialogues that we have, that we've set up. What's critical, though, I think, is that it, it is now at the, at really at the center of the relationship. Uh, it is not, uh, it is not a, uh, an adjunct issue. Uh, it's an issue that is very much, uh, very much on the, uh, uh, on the table at this point. Uh, with respect to the question that you asked directly about whether they acknowledge it, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it, it, uh, you could ask whether or not the Chinese government uh, at the most senior levels was aware of all the activities that have been underway with respect to cyber-enabled theft. Uh, uh, you can't answer that question no today. You have to say quite directly, and it's quite obvious now, that the Chinese senior leadership under understand clearly the importance of this issue to the United States and he imports the United States of, of seeking resolution of this issue. Hi. If I could just draw you out a little yeah. bit more on that, Tom. You yeah. said that the President went through some very specific information yeah. about cyber hacking. Did he outline some specific cases of the theft? And, and if you could go into North Korea a little bit, yeah. what specifically did they agree to do? Did they, are there going to be more talks? Uh, go back to the United Nations, what exactly? Yeah, with, with, re, with respect to cyber, uh, I think it's accurate to say that the President uh, uh, described to President Xi uh, the exact kinds of types of uh, problems that we're concerned about uh, and underscored that uh, the United States did not have any doubt about what was going on here, uh, that in fact that, uh, that these, that these uh, activities have been underway and that they were inconsistent with the kind of relationship that we want to build with China. Uh, which is a, which is a, a comprehensive partnership. Uh, having a comprehensive partnership uh, at the same time, when you have large-scale theft underway, uh, is, is 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 not going to is, is well, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, uh, going to be very difficult to do. But this, as I say to Julie, I think that what's important here is you know this is a broad relationship with China. Uh, we have a full range of issues. We have a half a trillion dollar a year trade relationship with China. We have all manner of interaction between the United States and China. We are highly inter interdependent countries and societies and economies. Uh, and again, we have a range of issues, and this is an issue that's come to the fore, and it's one that's going to have to be resolved 
again, in the context of this broad, of this broad relationship. With respect to North Korea, uh, I think the important point here is uh, full agreement on the goals, uh, that is denuclearization, a full agreement that, in fact, uh, uh, that the Security Council resolutions, which put pressure on North Korea, need to be enforced, uh, and full agreement that we will work together uh, to, uh, to look at steps that need to be taken in order to achieve the goal. Why? Now, now, let's talk about that for just a second also with respect to the motivations here. Uh, uh, how have the Chinese and the United States come to the same view with respect to, uh, with respect to North Korea and the absolute um, unacceptability of their pursuing uh, a full-on nuclear weapons program? And I think it comes to this. It comes to the, to the uh, impacts, if you will, of North Korea continuing to, continue to pursue uh, a nuclear weapons program, uh, which would allow them to become a proliferator, which would allow them to, pr to present a threat to the United States, as we've discussed, I've discussed with this group before, and which would allow them uh, to really upend, if you will, security in Northeast Asia. Uh, a, uh, a recognized nuclear weapons state in Pyongyang, a weapons program in Pyongyang, would of course have uh, profound implications uh, in the rest of Northeast Asia. And these are obviously a, a, a results that the Chinese don't want to see, that are results the United States doesn't want to see. So I think what you have essentially un underway here is a shared threat analysis uh, and a shared analysis as to what the implications and impact would be of North Korea pursuing, uh, pursuing a nuclear weapons program. Yeah. Mark? Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Can I ask a Pfizer question? Yeah, but I'd oh, rather. sorry. Can I ask a Pfizer question? Can yeah. you tell me um, what kind of investigation the president wants into the leaks of the Pfizer material? Does he want a criminal investigation? Mm -hmm. Ben, do you want yeah, to take this question? Yeah. This, um, the, uh, first of all, uh, Mark, what we're focused on doing right now, and you've seen this in the DNI statement, is frankly doing an assessment of the damage that is being done to U.S. national security by the revelation of this information, which is you know, ne necessarily secret because the United States needs to be able to conduct intelligence activities without those methods being revealed to the world. Um, so currently there's a review underway, of course, to understand uh, what potential damage may be done. As it relates to any uh, potential investigations, uh, we're still in the early stages of this. Uh, obviously the Justice Department would have to be involved in that. Uh, so this is something that, that I think will be addressed uh, in the coming days uh, by the Justice Department and the intelligence community uh, in consultation with um, you know, the full interagency that it's been affected uh, by these uh, very uh, disturbing leaks uh, of national security information. And uh, one more on China, on the wider side. Can you talk about the events that we just witnessed yesterday? The President is meeting up with the President. Under the bench. <laughs> I'll let Ben do the bench. I, 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 uh, I have a, I understand a few facts about the bench. Um, uh, the bench um, was made out of a, a, a redwood uh, that, um, uh, you know, which is obviously very unique to this part of the United States. Um, and uh, the protocol office, I think, can give you more uh, details. Um, but, you know, the, uh, I think Tom mentioned that the two leaders were able to take a walk um, and, uh, you know, were able to sit on what became the, uh, the bench that uh, the Chinese will be uh, uh, taking with them. Um, but again, I think, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's illustrative of, uh, you know, the beautiful part of the world that we're in, uh, of course, extending up farther, farther north, um, and uh, we can get you additional details from the, our protocol people. Mark, just a, a, a couple of things to add on that, though, not with respect to the bench specifically, but with respect to the uh, personal interaction between President Obama and President uh, Xi. Um, we, uh, as I said earlier, really saw this as an opportunity for the two presidents uh, at, a, at an important moment here uh, to deepen their personal relationship, uh, to establish and deepen their personal relationship as a foundation for going forward to address the range of issues that we have to address. And I think from that perspective that this uh, uh, meeting was, was quite successful. Uh, a lot of time together, uh, a lot of personal t time together, including, uh, again, quite unusual for uh, the president of China and the president of uh, of the United States to spend a pure one-on-one -on -one time together without any aides present, just interpreters, as I said, for an extended period of time. Um, a, uh, uh, a very, you know, a, a, a very um, lively dinner uh, last evening. Uh, and also, at the end of the sessions today, Mark, uh, uh, the President also was able to spend some time with uh, President Xi and his uh, spouse, uh, Madame Peng. 
uh, this afternoon uh, for about 30 minutes uh, before the uh, Chinese delegation left for, uh, left for Beijing. So I wanted to give you a sense of kind of all those elements uh, that we think are important to, to, to building the kind of relationship that, we, that we'd like to see built between the two, uh, between the two leaders, uh, as well as the relationship that we're building between the two governments. Okay. Okay. Hi. Okay. I think President Xi invited President Obama to mm -hmm. China. It's important to follow up on that quickly to yeah. build on this relationship. Mm -hmm. Could you talk briefly about a little bit of the color in the meeting with the First Lady of China and then turning to the FISA question. Now that the DNI declassified some information about PRISM, maybe you can speak a little bit more freely about it. Can you help people understand um, now that the administration says only non-U.S. persons are targeted, The Guardian reports that three billion digital items were collected off U.S. servers just in March. How can you explain that and assure Americans that surveillance was limited to non-Americans? Okay, thanks, Jessica. Uh, with respect to the visits, um, again, uh, this was a, a unique visit uh, uh, to California by President Xi. And by the way, it was also another interesting aspect of this is that the United States proposed this uh, and there was really quite a, a quick acceptance uh, by President Xi of the invitation uh, to, uh, to, have this, to have this meeting quite early in his term. Um, with respect to vis future visits, which is your, your question, I think they come in two categories, uh, and we discussed them in the meetings. But one would be a, a similar informal visit to China, uh, and the other would be the more formal reciprocal exchange of state visits. Uh, and the uh, presidents discussed both those issues and agreed to have their teams work on the timing and attempt to schedule us. I, I, think the, I think the bottom line is, is this, though, Jessica. Number one is that the president would like to have a similar uh, session in, in, in the China, outside the capital, in a more relaxed setting, to have the kind of informal uh, give and take uh, that, he had, uh, that he had here. Uh, and certainly, we will work uh, to put together the next, if you will, cycle of exchanges of, uh, of state visits to Washington and, uh, and Beijing. Uh, with respect to the meeting uh, that the president had with uh, uh, Madame Peng and, and President Xi. Uh, it was about 30 minutes. Uh, it took place uh, in the in the sunroom, if you, uh, uh, in the uh, Annenberg House. Um, they discussed uh, a number of things, including uh, her her career and her activities uh, as First Lady of China. Ben, do you want to take this one? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Jessica. First of all, I'd I'd point you to the the DNI facts on Prism, um, which uh, I think put out a lot of information, um, including the fact that uh, the U.S. government uh, cannot target anyone um, under the court-approved procedures for Section 702 collection uh, unless there is a foreign intelligence purpose for uh, the acquisition of that information. So in other words, uh, if even for uh, foreign persons, uh, there has to be an additional step to identify uh, a nexus um, to foreign intelligence collection to pursue additional information. For U.S. citizens uh, and U.S. persons and people in the United States, they cannot be intentionally targeted by this program. Um, so they are not a part of uh, what the goal of this uh, collection is. Furthermore, uh, if any U.S. citizen were to become engaged uh, in uh, what were, was engaged in activities that were of interest to the government, we would have to, just as with the phone uh, situation, we would have to go back and obtain a warrant uh, to pr pursue further collection on the content of any uh, U.S. individual's uh, communications. So there would have to be an additional layer uh, beyond PRISM for the U.S. government to pursue, review um, information associated with uh, a U.S. person's potential connection to, uh, for instance, uh, terrorism. I can't comment. I mean, the NSA and the intelligence community are the appropriate people to comment on the volume of this data. Uh, to be clear here, um, it's not as if um, this, you know, there are people sitting there reading every piece of information that may be in a universe of collection that the U.S. government has. Um, and, you know, as we discussed with the, the phone program, there is a, a type of data that we, we call metadata that is a more extensive but a more anonymous type of collection. Uh, I think the point that's very important for Americans to understand uh, is that for the U.S. government uh, to decide to pursue an investigation of an American citizen uh, or a U.S. person, uh, there would have to be an additional step uh, beyond these programs that have been uh, described uh, to get a warrant uh, and to essentially pursue 
uh, pursue a lead uh, if there's a suspected nexus uh, to terrorism. Uh, so, you know, just as the president said, we're not listening to anybody's phone calls. Uh, we're not also going out and seeking to read uh, people's electronic communications. Uh, if we were able to detect a potential nexus to terrorism, we'd have to go back to a judge uh, and pursue a, a warrant to try to uh, investigate that lead, just as we would uh, in any other intelligence or, or criminal procedure. Uh, so as the, the fact sheet makes clear, uh, these are broad uh, programs uh, that do not, again, target U.S. persons uh, or people in the United States. Uh, and to go a, a step deeper, uh, we'd have to go back and go through all the procedures of getting an additional warrant. I think that the uh, fact sheet also lays out, uh, as we've said with uh, the information related to uh, telephone data, uh, that this is rigorously overseen by all three branches of government. So this is a FISA provision, so the court is involved in all of this activity. Uh, this is also overseen by Congress, and there are semi-annual reports, for instance, provided to Congress uh, on these activities. Uh, and they're obviously uh, part of the Patriot Act that has been reauthorized by Congress in 2009-2011. Uh, and, of course, the executive branch has built in procedures for reviewing these programs through inspector generals and other mechanisms uh, to make sure that uh, there's not abuse uh, and to make sure that we're putting in place appropriate safeguards uh, to protect the privacy and civil liberties of the American people. Uh, uh, well, let me take well, uh, well, let, we'll, we'll get to you, but uh, I'm gonna, let's go to uh, Jackie here. Hi, um, just on two yeah. separate things real quick. Yeah. Did you discuss at all the Trans-Pacific Partnership and did China indicate a willingness to, to join those discussions? Mm -hmm. And on the um, climate change, it's quite a um, significant yeah. agreement that you released. You said before the meeting there would be no deliverables. Yeah. Does this not qualify as a deliverable? Was it a surprise that this came together? No, thanks, Jackie. Uh, with respect to the second question, I'll come back to, I'll come back to the first in a minute. Um, not a surprise, we've been working on it. You know, earlier this year, Secretary Kerry set up a working group on climate uh, to develop uh, practical steps that we could take together to address climate change. Uh, and during the course of the meeting, by the way, more generally, the President did discuss client and, uh, climate and, of course, agreed that we had a strong joint interest uh, in addressing the climate issue, a strong joint interest from, from a lot of perspectives, including sustainable economic growth. So as a result of the working group's efforts, uh, that uh, there was ready today uh, an example of practical cooperation. Uh, and it was, it was Jackie just ready for the two presidents to agree to uh, today to work together to address the impact of the uh, hydrofluorocarbons on climate change. You know, the U.S. has been leading the effort uh, to uh, use the Montreal Protocol process to phase down the production uh, and consumption of HFCs. Uh, more than 100 countries support the effort. And today, importantly, China agreed to work with the U.S. on this initiative. Uh, you know, HSDs, as you know, are a potent source of uh, greenhouse gases. I think we're, we've passed out a detailed fact sheet with respect uh, to this agreement. But again, I think I've I just underscored this sort of practical cooperation we're working on to see more of in the climate change area and in other areas of our relationship. So the bottom line there is that uh, we had the working group set up, uh, the work had been done, uh, it was ready to be agreed to, and we didn't see any need, any reason that the presence across the table just shouldn't agree to it today and put it out uh, formally. Um, uh, with respect to our uh, joint work now at the Montreal and the Montreal process. Um, second, the other question you asked was about TPP. Uh, a couple of points on that. Um, as you know, the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a, uh, one of the major initiatives that the, that the administration has underway. Uh, it's really the principal thrust of our uh, economic work and our rebalancing effort in Asia. Uh, we uh, hope to try to complete uh, the TPP uh, by later this year, uh, maybe as early as October. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's been a very important project for us. Uh, it was discussed uh, a bit today uh, with uh, uh, President Xi indicating that China was interested in having information on the process as it went forward uh, and being briefed on the process and maybe setting up a, a more formal mechanism for the Chinese to have information on the process and the, pro and the prog progress that we're making with respect to the TPP negotiations. And of course, we've agreed, to, we've agreed to do that. Essentially, it was a request for some transparency with respect to the effort. Um, and again, we, we expect to complete that effort uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this year. That, of course, uh, uh, is the, one of the major trade initiatives that we have underway. Another one we'll be discussing when we go to Northern Ireland at the G8 uh, later, this, uh, later this month, which is the trade investment uh, uh, agreement we seek to uh, uh, negotiate and complete with the Europeans, which are, I think, two of the, two of the major economic initiatives in the world right now. 
at this point, that was their request. Yeah, just to be direct. Well, you know, we, we, the, the, at, at this point, as I said, you know, we, ha we, we have been uh, working very hard on this, right? We are substantially along, uh, al along the path with respect to this, uh, with respect to this agreement. Uh, we hope to complete it this year. Uh, and President Xi's uh, point today was that the Chinese would like to be uh, kept informed and have some transparency into the, into the process. Uh, and I've, I've just given you everything that was said on it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Jackie. Ben, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, was there anything President Obama tell Mr. Xi about the, the tension between Japan and China over the Senkaku Island? They discussed the uh, Senkaku Island uh, issue uh, at some length last night at the dinner. Um, and the United States uh, um, view on this, as you know, is we don't take, an, we don't take a position ultimately on the sovereignty issue. Uh, but the President's uh, points last night were along these lines, uh, that, uh, that the uh, party should seek to de-escalate, not escalate. And the party should seek to have conversations about this uh, through diplomatic channels and not through actions uh, on the, uh, uh, out in the East China Sea. Um, that's essentially the, uh, the, uh, uh, the conversation that took, place, that took place last night. I wanted to talk to you specifically about Sunny Lands. Why did you choose the Annenberg Estate? Yeah. And uh, did the presidents have a chance to golf, go fishing? Does the president have plans to use the golf course? And uh, were you guys a little bit disappointed that President Xi did not stay at the estate? Well, uh, we uh, thank you for the question. Uh, number one, we uh, uh, came to the facility here because uh, we, from, we were familiar with it as a, as a, as a, uh, as a co available conference center for presidential meetings and st secretary of state meetings. Um, so we had, we, had, we had had a file on Sunnylands, if you would, as a, uh, as a possible summit place, um, number one. Number two, as I said earlier, we were, we were seeking to have a, uh, a, an early meeting between President Obama and President Xi. Uh, President Xi was traveling to Latin America. President Obama was going to be on the, east, on the west coast uh, in uh, the month of June. Uh, and we uh, lighted on the idea uh, that one way to do this at a relaxed setting would be to, and to do it early, would be to have it in California. Again, connected with President Xi's visit to, uh, to Mexico and Central America and to President Obama's planned visits out here to Northern California and Los Angeles. Uh, so it, it fit together. Uh, and as you know, it's a, uh, it's a facility which is uh, uh, intentionally and precisely designed uh, for exactly these kinds, uh, for exactly these kinds of meetings, uh, and it was a terrific facility uh, for us to uh, for us to use today. I don't know. I, you know, yeah, I, 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 you know, President Obama was staying here, and the and the Chinese delegation stayed at its hotel. Uh, that's the normal. That that would be the normal approach uh, that, uh, that that you take. It would be unusual for that to stay in the same place. What about golf? I don't know about golf. Uh, we'll keep you updated. On yeah, golf. yeah, yeah. I do a lot of. I do, uh, I do a lot of things at, at the, uh, in my current position, and one of them is not golf. <laughs> right. uh, Mr. Donovan, Hi. what type of uh, outreach is the administration going to do with other Asian allies specifically about this meeting yes. in order to reassure them in a situation where the U.S. and China are getting much closer that it's not at the cost of the other allies being edged out? Yeah. And then... Secondly, on the timing of your announced departure, it seemed yeah. a little odd that it came just days before the summit. Could you maybe explain the context of that timing and uh, why it was before and not after? Yeah, okay. Number one, with it's an excellent question on the allies and partners in the region. Um, we have been in touch with allies and partners on the region prior to this, uh, to this meeting uh, to go through with them uh, what we expected to be the issues in our approach. I personally talked to senior officials in most of the allied uh, governments uh, prior to the session. Uh, we certainly will be in, in direct touch with them uh, uh, after the session. Uh, I think I actually have meetings with uh, representatives on, on Tuesday uh, to go through a, a complete debrief. And I expect that the president will be in touch with, uh, with his counterparts of the key allies uh, to, go through, to go through this. Again, um, this, is, uh, this is part of our rebalancing effort here. You know? and, and our rebalancing effort to Asia is a comprehensive effort uh, to, uh, what, to correct what we saw as an imbalance in our efforts globally uh, to invest more in Asia because we see our future linked uh, to Asia increasingly in the, as we go into the 21st century. And that, uh, as I said earlier, that rebalancing effort has a, many elements to it. Uh, it includes, uh, first and foremost, uh, reinvigoration of our alliances. 
And I think we've been quite successful on that, frankly, uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, the time we've come into office. It includes uh, engaging and deepening our relationship with emerging powers, uh, such as India and Indonesia, and we've been quite active on that. Uh, it involves our working on the, uh, uh, if you will, the security and political architecture uh, in, uh, in Asia. And we have uh, been working very hard on that, including, by the way, the President's decision to participate at the summit level in the East Asia Summit and our determination to make that institution be the premier diplomatic and security institution uh, uh, in Asia. And I think that's made a big difference. It includes our efforts, as I was just discussing with Jackie, on the economic side, uh, where we're trying to build out the economic architecture and come up with a win-win approaches here. Uh, and the TTP is our principal effort right now with respect to uh, economics. And it includes building a productive and constructive relationship with China. Our partners and allies in the region uh, expect us to meet our obligations to them. They expect the United States to continue to undertake the uh, uh, security efforts, uh, forming the platform, if you will, which has been the basis on which the economic uh, and social development of Asia has been built, and to continue to provide all that. But they also expect us to uh, engage in a productive and constructive relationship with China. Uh, and we have those dual expectations. And as a, a principal power in Asia, we go about meeting those, ex those, those, uh, those expectations. With respect to my plans, uh, my um, uh, 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 conversations with the President with respect to my, my retiring from this current job to, uh, began really at the end of last year. Uh, the President asked me to stay uh, on through the middle of this year. We had a number of projects that we had underway, including uh, uh, trips that we've taken, including to the Middle East and other places, a number of the economic initiatives that I've talked about here, and working on the China relationship, uh, which, we have, which we have done. Uh, I wanted to have a as those of you who know me, you can, this is not going to surprise you, I wanted to have a structured and uh, timely transition. I wanted to have enough time uh, for Ambassador Rice to work with me uh, day in and day out as she begins her uh, uh, tenure as National Security Advisor uh, on July 1, right up, to the, right up to the middle of the year. Uh, and this was, this was the timing that worked for that, frankly. Uh, this has been carefully considered. Uh, it has been the subject of multiple conversations between me and the President and me and, and uh, Ambassador Rice, um, and it was, the, it, was the right, it was the right time. Now, why before, the, uh, why before the, uh, the meetings today? I thought it was important, frankly, to be uh, uh, as transparent with my Chinese uh, counterparts as possible. I have been, uh, as you know, uh, you know the principal uh, White House person dealing with the Chinese senior Chinese leadership uh, since we come into office. Uh, I have spent... Uh, tens and tens of hours with the senior leadership uh, uh, in China over the last uh, four and a half years. Uh, and frankly, I, I would not have been comfortable uh, coming to a summit with individuals with whom I've been working on some of the most sensitive issues in the world and not be totally upfront with them on what my plans were going to be. Thank you. President Obama mentioned that U.S. and China should have a healthy competition. So uh, could you elaborate on what a healthy competition will be like? Uh, what areas those competition will come from? And uh, what uh, we will expect from the U.S. to work with China to build that healthy competition? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, the, it's the kind of healthy competition you would expect between uh, any two large countries uh, in all, all manner of, uh, of areas, including an economic area. Um, and so it was, a, I think, a, a pretty straightforward observation about, uh, about, the, about the relationship. Now, uh, what, though, we have also been talking about here is, is, is the importance of not having the relationship deteriorate unnecessarily into strategic rivalry, if you will. And again, this is really what's at the root of this new model of great power relations that President Xi and President Obama have talked about, that President Clinton, for, uh, that uh, Secretary Clinton also talked about in a very important speech she gave last year at the U.S. Institute for Peace. What is the root of this? Uh, why, why, why have we come on to this? And it's rooted in the conversation that you and I are having. It's rooted in the observation uh, and the view by many people, particularly in the international relations field, and some people in the United States and some people in China, that a rising power and an existing power are in some manner destined for conflict. Uh, that in fact, this is, a, this is a, a, just an, an, an inexorable dynamic uh, between a rising power and an existing power. Uh, we reject that. Uh, and, the, and the Chinese government rejects that. And the building out of the, of the so-called new relationship, uh, new model of relationship between, between great powers is the effort uh, to uh, ensure that doesn't happen, uh, is an effort to ensure that we don't uh, 
uh, succumb to the idea that somehow relations between countries are some, uh, subject to some immutable law of physics. Uh, that in fact, this is about leadership, it's about conscious decisions, and it's about doing what's best for your respective people. Okay. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, I had a broad um, national security policy question, uh, which I'd like to address to the National Security Advisor if possible, because it's not specifically about Pfizer. Um, yesterday, the President said that uh, the American people shouldn't be alarmed at what they've learnt this week um, about surveillance, because there was sufficient oversight from both Congress and the judiciary. Yeah. What, what would you say to um, those who say that you have been invoking special privilege on numerous occasions to stop appeals reaching courts? And in the case of congressional oversight, very recently Congress was told that you didn't uh, count how many times US data was ac accessed. Whereas today, through the boundless informant uh, data mining tool that we've um, written about today, we find out you count every last I ISP num IP number, IP address. So what is, how can you reassure the American people that that congressional and judicial oversight is working in the way that the president says it is? Well, that's a, that's a specific question you asked, and I'll turn that over to Ben. But the, the, uh, I think I can say this, though, uh, is that these programs are very important to the United States and its ability to protect itself, number one. Number two, as the president said yesterday, these programs are subject to oversight, not just in the executive branch, which has very careful procedures and processes to ensure particularly that the privacy of, and civil liberties of Americans are protected, but also subject to very careful uh, oversight by uh, a court, uh, an independent branch of government in the United States, and through careful and persistent briefing and oversight by the Congress. And that, uh, that, that's, a, I think, a very important, uh, a very important aspect of, uh, of this entire discussion as the President laid out yesterday. Yeah. Uh, on, on the specifics, you had a, a kind of a couple of questions there. Um, first of all, I think as NSA provided uh, in a statement to The Guardian, uh, they do not have the ability to determine with certainty the identity or location of, of all communicants you know, within a given uh, communication that they're collecting. So um, it, it's not as if um, they have an ability uh, to answer specifically the question of, um, you know, what are the identities and numbers of uh, the individual uh, individuals associated with uh, collection. Um, what they do do is they apply uh, a range of tools, both automated and manual, um, to review and characterize communications and to ensure the protections uh, of the American people. So essentially what that means is uh, there are safeguards built into the way in which they uh, collect and review data uh, to ensure that privacy rights are respected. Uh, and as I said, any additional investigation associated with anybody um, would require additional authorities being granted uh, by a judge. With respect to uh, the Congress, uh, on, on the uh, Section 702 uh, um, program that was uh, declassified uh, today, uh, this was reauthorized by Congress uh, in December uh, 2012, uh, and it re has a re reporting requirement to Congress. Uh, so the Director of National Intelligence and the Attorney General uh, have to provide semi-annual reports that assess compliance with the targeting procedures as well as the minimization procedures associated with uh, targeting. Uh, and there are additional briefings uh, that are made to both the Intelligence and the Judiciary Committees uh, in Congress uh, associated with uh, this particular uh, program. Uh, I, would, I would also note uh, for people, uh, and we've uh, made this uh, available, uh, that with respect to the other, uh, the other provisions uh, you know, associated with telephone data under FISA, uh, we, uh, I think, made available to people that there have been numerous, uh, I think, 13 uh, uh, briefings that we identified that have been given uh, over the uh, recent, uh, in the recent past on that provision uh, of FISA. Uh, there's, uh, and also uh, the relevant intelligence oversight committee uh, is uh, the Intelligence Committee, uh, and uh, I think uh, you've seen a letter from Senators Feinstein and Chambliss from last February, or February of 2011, that um, offered uh, to provide briefings to other members of Congress who had additional questions about, uh, about these, uh, particular, this particular program uh, authorized by FISA. So the point is, you know, people have asked about what is the President's view generally, um, and I've been with the President since uh, early 2007, uh, and he expressed concerns about some of the lack of oversight and safeguards associated with 
programs in the past. Uh, for instance, when you had warrantless wiretapping that did not have that full oversight of a judge. What he's done as president is say which programs are necessary, which capabilities are necessary to protect the American people, uh, and which aren't. So for instance, uh, the enhanced interrogation technique uh, program that we felt amounted to torture, we did not feel was appropriate with our values or necessary for our national security, so we ended that program. Uh, with respect to some of these other programs that have been in the news recently, uh, the principle that he brings to bear is how do we ensure that there are appropriate checks and balances and oversight built into everything that we do. So for instance, how do we make sure that all three branches of government have eyes on these programs? They are necessarily secret. Uh, we have an intelligence community for a reason. We have a threat from terrorism that we have to combat. We have an enemy that deliberately tries to work around our methods of intelligence collection. So we can't simply broadcast to our terrorist enemy, here's how we collect intelligence on you. That's why, given the fact that it's secret, you need to bring in the courts and you need to bring in Congress. Uh, so everything that has been done and reported on in the last several days involves programs that have congressional oversight and regularized congressional oversight from the relevant committees, also through the reauthorization of the Patriot Act and other briefings, there's opportunities for other members to be briefed on these programs. So the elected representatives of the American people do have eyes on uh, these programs. With respect to the courts, it's a FISA uh, program. So by definition, there is a judge who must sign off on these activities, and as I said, there must be additional sign-off uh, if there's going to be efforts uh, to pursue an investigation. And we build in checks within the executive branch. So we've established uh, under our administration very regularized inspector general reports of everything that we're doing. So within the context of necessarily secret programs, uh, we make sure that there are layers of oversight from all three branches of government. Uh, and that's something that the president believes is necessary to ensure that their privacy and civil liberties uh, concerns that are taken into account to ensure that we're reviewing whether these programs are effective and necessary, given the nature of the threat uh, that we're facing. Uh, and that's the principle that he'll continue to bring to bear. And the debate that's been sparked by these revelations, uh, as he said, uh, while we do not think that the revelation of secret uh, programs is in the national security interest of the United States, the broader debate about privacy and civil liberties, he lifted up himself in his speech at NDU the other day, uh, when he went out of his way to identify this as one of the trade-offs that we have to wrestle with given the fact that if we did everything necessary for our security, we would sacrifice um, too much privacy and civil liberties. But if we did everything necessary to have 100% privacy and civil liberties protections, we wouldn't be taking common sense steps uh, to protect the American people. So we'll have that debate. Uh, we welcome uh, congressional interest in these issues. We welcome the interest of the American people and, of course, the media in these uh, issues. Uh, but we feel confident that we've done what we need to do to strike this balance between privacy and security uh, by building in uh, these rigorous oversight mechanisms. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to take the pass. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Uh, okay. With regard to North Korea, did, did they discuss about the resuming six party talks or about strengthening the sanctions against North Korea? Mm -hmm. And my second question is did they discuss about the re repatriation of North Korean defectors? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, with respect to, uh, uh, to North Korea, that we, there was a discussion about the importance of enforcing the United Nations Security Council resolutions and, increase, and, and continuing that pressure on North Korea so that the choice is very clear uh, to uh, North Korea. On the six party talks, um, uh, there was a discussion about uh, the importance of any talks going forward being authentic and credible. That is, talks that would uh, actually lead to a uh, to, a, to a sensible result. Um, and we really haven't seen from the North Koreans at this point uh, that kind of uh, commitment on the substance uh, of potential talks, I think, at this point to move forward. Uh, and I didn't, on the, I, I don't, that was not discussed. So last question, we'll go to Chris. Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, Tom. How far in advance did you realize that the Chinese First Lady would be coming to this summit? And did you think about including Mrs. Obama in the events at all? Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact timeline, uh, but, but uh, my understanding is that uh, when we scheduled uh, the, uh, uh, the meetings here, um, that there was a discussion about uh, uh, Madame Pong coming, uh, and that it was indicated at that point that uh, Mrs. Obama's schedule would not permit, permit her to come on these dates here. Uh, and the dates, of course, are driven by a number of other factors, right? President Xi's travel schedule, President Obama's travel schedule. Uh, and so that was understood well in advance, uh, well in advance of the meetings. 
I, yeah, I, I just want to say thank you. They're they really thoughtful questions. It's obviously an enormously important relationship, an enormously important uh, moment for this relationship. And the, uh, the, the, the thoughtful questions really are appreciated. Uh, and I'll see you in, uh, in Northern Ireland and in Germany. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you.